Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Global Compliance live webinar on the FDA drug development process. My name is Michael, and I'll be a host for today's session. And on behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all for being part of today's event. Today's webinar is being presented by Mr. Albert A. Gignal. A few words about Albert before we start off today's session. Albert has an MS RAC. He's also the CEO of AAG Incorporated. And for more than 30 years, his focus has been on FDA-related matters in regulatory affairs, quality assurance, and clinical affairs. And he's also had expertise in dealing with all aspects of the FDA approval process for drugs, biologics, medical devices, and generic drugs. And he's also worked in every major segment of the industry research, quality assurance, regulatory affairs, manufacturing, and clinical. And he's also been responsible for regulatory submissions, registrations, FDA liaison, clinical studies, compliance activities, and also FDA training. And he also has expertise in the assessment of product and facilities for due diligence relative to FDA requirements as well. And uh, Albert lectures throughout the world on numerous FDA-related matters. And he's also a consultant to the FDA and also trains FDA field force, uh, those who conduct FDA inspections on GCP, GLP, and GMP. And in addition, he also trains FDA personnel. And Albert also consults and trains for drug, biologic, and medical device companies, US Army's HIV Research Group, NIH Age Group, and also the US Army Surgical Research Group and the Naval Medical Research Group. And he's also a member of the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society, which selected him in the 1984's Professional of the Year. And he's also served the society as a vice president, president, and also the chairman of the board of directors. And in recent years, he's also filed numerous FDA drug, biologic, and medical device submissions for product approval. And in addition, Albert also has been involved in two of the largest clinical trials conducted, which are the 8,000 patient clinical trials in Africa and the 16,000 patient clinical trials in Thailand. And we are honored to have Albert with us today to present today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start off today's session, I just want to quickly outline today's program. This webinar is for a 90-minute duration. First, Albert will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that he would cover, and then share with you his presentation. And also, would like to inform all our attendees present that once part of today's teleconference, you've been placed on mute and would remain so until the Q&A begins. You have over 10 minutes to the end for your Q&A, but if you do come up with questions during the session, ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to use the Q&A option or the chat messenger to send in your questions. And also, for any reason, if you do get logged out of today's session, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we're all ready, I request Albert to take it from you. Albert? Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to this um webinar on drug development process. I would uh, start off talking about the FDA itself, introducing them. Then we'll cover the IND process, investigational new drug process, where you study um, your new drug. And then, of course, we'll, we'll talk about the NDA process, the new drug application. That's the marketing application one makes to FDA if one wants, wants to market a drug in the United States. So let's start off by introducing you to FDA. Food and Drug Administration is the federal government's primary consumer protection agency. Today, FDA is 9,000 strong and uh, is still growing. They, uh, if you look in the United States here, um, FDA uh, takes uh, 25, 25 cents out of every dollar that you spend. That's for the products that they oversee, the products that they regulate. So they have a tremendous impact on us here in the United States. As far as drugs, biologics, devices, generic drugs, FDA is the regulatory body which oversees all of this, and they do it under uh, many laws and regulations, but the major law under which they work is the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act. Now, this is their mission statement, which came back uh, about in 1997. It is the first time FDA has a mission statement, not one word about enforcement. The first part, FDA must promote the public health by promptly and efficiently reviewing clinical research and taking appropriate action on marketing of regulated products in a timely manner. So what they're saying in the, the first part of the mission statement is 
Hey, listen, uh, we understand you're studying your products during these IND process. Uh, we will um, assist you there. And then when you file the marketing application, the NDA for a small chemical um, candidate, um, the BLA, biologic license application for a biologic product, and an ANDA, abbreviated new drug application for a generic, we will look at this in an efficient manner. Number two, FDA must promote the public health by ensuring that foods are safe, wholesome, sanitary. Notice, foods have no efficacy requirements. They're safe, they're wholesome, they're sanitary. On the other hand, if we talk about drugs, biologics, devices, um, they are considered uh, to have to be safe and effective. And of course, the law itself has a third category, if you read the Food and Drug Act, it says to get a drug, a biologic, or a medical device on the marketplace in the United States has to be safe, effective, and subject of an approved application. Now, how does the system work? And, and this is the system we're going to go through today. Um, you, the company, do all the studies. You put together a marketing application, and you try to demonstrate to FDA that the product's safe and effective based on this data. FDA then will review that, and if they agree with you, they will then make your submission, your product, subject of an approved application. So that's how the system works. There is a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness of devices intended for human use. That's all part of the safety and efficacy. FDA also regulates cosmetics, but here they have very little control, um, much different than drugs where they have a um, tremendous amount of control. Um, all FDA can do relative to cosmetics is once a cosmetics on the marketplace, they can regulate the labeling, but that's it. Um, they also protect us under the medical device laws from electronic product radiation. Um, they also participate with other countries to reduce the burden of regulation, to harmonize regulatory requirements across the globe. They are, by the way, one of the co-founders of the International Conference on Harmonization. These are the centers that FDA oversees. We uh, will be talking about the drug and biologic centers today. Now you might say, wait a minute, this is a drug development process course or webinar. Where does biologics come in? In the United States, all biologics are regulated as drug products. So when you say the term biologic, you're talking about a subset of the term drug. Um, they're, they're a small subset of the general overall drug definition. So as soon as I say dry, a drug, I automatically include a biologic. So we'll be talking about uh, that category of product here in the U.S. Many of you have heard the acronym 21 CFR. Um, many of you have heard it but don't really fully understand what it's all about. So let me explain what 21 CFR is all about. Back when our country started in around 1770 nine or so, um, one of the first things we realize is we are going to have a lot of agencies, a lot of these um, different various agencies. So um, and it became a burden to call them by full name or full title, and eventually we came up with a numbering system. Today we have 50 title numbers. FDA uh, is referred to as Title 21. So whenever you hear the phrase Title 21 relative to the U.S. government, it means FDA. CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. The, this is the uh, nine volumes um, um, that have all the FDA rules and regulations, and uh, they're updated on a yearly basis. Um, the second major thing we realized uh, when we um, our country first started is these government people actually work for us. So how are we going to know what they do every day? Well, they came up with a newsletter. Today the newsletter is called the Federal Register. Every day the government works, there is eventually a Federal Register produced for that date. Um, if now one picks up that Federal Register, it will have all 50 title numbers in it. We will then turn to Title 21, FDA section, and we will find out whatever happened to FDA on that day. Products they approved, new regulations, new guidances, notices to industry, and so on and so forth. Once a year in April, FDA goes back and collects the previous 12 months of editions of the Federal Register, and they codify them into these group of nine volumes that I mentioned, the Code of Federal Regulations. So therefore, um, this Code of Federal Regulations has all FDA's rules and regulations updated on a yearly basis. If you look at the 200 parts, 
Not only they have labeling regulations, they have the good manufacturing practice regulations. 300 part is for drugs, 600 part is for biologics, 800 part is for medical devices. So now let's look at a general overview of the whole process. How does the process actually work? And remember, we're very much restricted here with 90 minutes. This is a, a very general overview uh, of the drug development process. Companies today uh, work in pharmacologic areas. For example, uh, there are companies that work on CNS drugs, companies work uh, neurodrugs, cardiovascular drugs, and so on. So the scientists in these various companies now, well, what they'll be doing is studying diseases in this particular uh, pharmacologic area. They'll look at, they'll understand as much as they, we know about the disease. They'll look at the various aspects of the disease and what consequences does the disease have on the human, uh, assuming the human comes down with this particular disease or condition. Now, of course, there's a few other databases I haven't mentioned that they also use, and one of them is based on the Human Genome Project where we found out about the 20,000 some odd genes in our body, and we've associated certain genes with certain diseases and conditions. And of course, these genes also, uh, uh, some of them produce uh, protein products, such as alpha interferon, for example. Um, so based on all this information now, and looking at a particular disease in a pharmacologic area, what the um, scientist tries to do is intercede with this disease process. And what do I mean by intercede with the disease process? Well, they try to create a molecule that might cure the disease. Now, that doesn't happen very often, obviously, but certainly that's one of the goals. Or they could develop a molecule that might stop the disease from progressing any further. Or they might develop a molecule that might slow down the disease. Or and the last thing is if you can't do any of those, maybe they can give you some kind of relief uh, from what the consequences of the disease are. But that's about the limit. That's what we can do. So what they'll do now on a computer, I have a molecular modeling program, they will model a molecule um, to try to intercede with this disease uh, process. For example, they may develop a molecule that attaches itself to a receptor on a cell and could upregulate a gene, downregulate a gene, or we also have a thing called gene therapy, where we can go into the cell and incorporate a, a new gene if a gene is non-functional or a gene is missing from that particular individual. So they will eventually come up with this molecule. But this is only one molecule. And remember, here are some statistics for you. Each year in the United States, we develop 7,000 new molecules, 7,000. Out of those 7,000, only 10 will eventually get to market. So the attrition rate here is enormous. The chance of us finding something with just one molecule is very, very slim. So what your scientists do is they take this molecule that they've modeled and they put it through a process called combinatorial chemistry, which takes the base of major components of it and makes various, um, various libraries uh, of this um, particular uh, candidate molecule that you've modeled uh, on the computer. So now we have hundreds of variations of this particular molecule, which they'll now uh, test in vitro, uh, cell-based tests many times uh, on the lab bench. And what they'll try to do based on that type of testing is try now to screen through all these libraries of molecules that they've developed uh, and come up with some candidate molecules that they might m want to move forward with. Once they come up with these candidate molecules, they'll put them through some further testing, uh, pharmacology profile, toxicology profile. But in the end, what they're hoping to do is to come up with a molecule where they can move now forward into uh, human clinical trials. And of course, when you talk about human clinical trials, you're talking about the IND process investigational new drug application. That's what IND stands for. Um, and if it takes you 10 years from the time you develop the product to the time it gets to marketplace, nine of those years are spent under the IND. All the research that you ever do is done under an IND. No research is ever done under an NDA, a new drug application, or a BLA, a biologic li uh, license application. 
Research is done under the IND. So if you find this candidate molecule, you may want to schedule a pre-IND meeting with FDA before you file a document with FDA to discuss um, the molecule, to discuss the testing you've done, what you plan to do. Assuming FDA agrees with what you came forward with, you will file the IND. And FDA now will have 30 calendar days to look at it. And within those 30 calendar days, um, they will determine if this IND is acceptable to move forward into human clinical trials. Now notice, I want you to understand one thing. INDs are never approved. If you go around saying my IND gets approved, uh, most people will realize you don't understand how the FDA system works. It's a passive system. INDs become effective. So once your IND is effective, you can begin clinical trials, and we got the usual phases of clinical trials. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a bit of a cold. I'm fighting off here. And once you finish um, the IND process, um, at the end of all the clinical trials, you put together the marketing document, which is the NDA, the new drug application. You may well have a pre-NDA meeting with FDA, file the NDA, hopefully FDA approves it, and then you can go to market. And believe me, this is a very, very uh, brief overview of the drug development process. But these are the basic elements that we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about the complete IND phase, the NDA phase, and so let's move forward. And let's look, talk about first what is a new drug, because that's that candidate molecule I keep talking about. This is the definition for a drug from the comes out of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And it's a four-part definition, but be careful here. You don't have to qualify for all four parts to be considered a drug. First of all, let's look at A. Articles recognized in official USP, United States Pharmacopeia, or any supplement there, too. Now, what's in the pharmacopeia? Well, approved products, products with long histories of safety and effectiveness. Our candidate molecule certainly doesn't fall into that category. This is something we, we just developed. Um, may never have seen a human before. And so, therefore, A is not going to qualify for us. So let's look at B. Articles intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in men. Now, certainly, the candidate molecule we developed falls in that category because it would fall under that labeling definition, but there's a problem here. Medical devices also fall under the same definition. They're developed for the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in men. So B is going to tell us whether we have a drug or a medical device. We don't know which. So let's look at C. Articles intended to affect the structure of any function of the body of man. Now, that's what's going to differentiate from us drugs and devices. If you are a drug, you have chemistry on or in the body and depend on being metabolized for your principal intended purpose. If you are a drug, you have chemistry on or in the body and depend on being metabolized for your principal intended purpose. For example, a person wakes up in the morning, takes the white tablet, and that certainly, when he swallows it, it, it generates chemistry in the body. Um, certainly, the, the, the product's going to be metabolized. Um, that metabolite will hit a certain organ system, and you will get a pharmacologic response. In this case, his blood pressure went down. That is a drug. It has chemistry. It depends on being metabolized for its principal intended purpose. On the other hand, if I take off the glasses that you are wearing right now, and I take these two plastic two pieces of plastic called contact lenses, and I put them in your eyes and I correct your vision. Well, certainly that also is a medical indication. If it's a medical indication, by the way, folks, it falls under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then also tells you FDA is the jurisdiction body. Uh, they're the body that will regulate you. Um, and then when I put these two pieces of plastic in your eyes, these contact lenses, I correct your vision. Um, I certainly now have this medical indication. But what am I? Am I a drug or a device? Well, let's look at this. First of all, is there chemistry there? Is there systemic chemistry? The answer is no. There might be a small amount of chemistry in the local eye area, but there certainly is no systemic chemistry here. And number two, does it depend on being metabolized for its principal intended purpose? No. It works physically. So what we have here is a product that has a medical indication, 
has limited or no chemistry and does not depend on being metabolized. So it's principal intended purpose that product's a medical device. All right? So as we go through this, you can see now we can differentiate a drug from a device, uh, assuming it's for a medical indication. The drug has chemistry on or in the body, depends on being metabolized for its principal intended purpose. The device has either no chemistry or limited chemistry and does not depend on being metabolized for its principal intended purpose. Of course, number four is any articles that might be associated uh, with the product, such as the delivery system uh, or cleaning agents for contact lenses. Um, these are all now become part of the drug or device system. <clears throat> New molecular entities, these are the candidate molecules that we are developing. Drugs containing active ingredients never before approved as a medicine in the United States. They could have, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, Drugs containing totally new chemical compounds that the world has never seen before. Um, if we're going to study that product now here in the United States, um, it is considered a new drug. Uh, or we also might study um, products that are already are known to men. Maybe they're approved in other countries. But when they're brought here to the United States, they are not approved here. They are considered new drugs, and we'll study them under the IND process. Or you might have an existing product that's already approved, but you want to make a significant change to it. For example, a second indication. For that second indication alone, it is considered a new drug. Once a drug gets approved in the United States, it's no longer a new drug. It then is an old drug. So you might well have a product uh, that you have on the marketplace for indication number one. That's considered an old drug. Now you want a second indication for it, and you're studying that under the IND, that second indication, that's considered a new drug. There's also other terms for drugs, OTC, over-the-counter drugs. These are drugs that you can go into the pharmacy or into the supermarket and buy them right off the shelf, okay? Um, cough preparations, uh, cold preparations, anti-diarrheal products, laxatives, and so on and so forth. They're approved... Uh, <clears throat> Um, they're not really approved. They're under a different system, let me should, I should uh, correctly say. They meet the qualifications of monographs that FDA has developed over the years. Uh, there's about 70, 80 monographs right now. Uh, what the monograph tells you is what active ingredients you can use, uh, what dosages for those active ingredients, what the label should say. There is no necessity for submissions here um, as long as one meets the monograph requirements. One registers your manufacturing facility and lists the product you're selling in the United States and follows GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice Regulations, one can go to market with these. So there's no necessity here for an FDA submission. Generics, different. A generic product is a copy of an existing approved product that FDA has uh, allowed on the marketplace. What we refer to as an innovator product. Once your new drug gets approved, your new candidate molecule, uh, FDA will then make a determination whether eventually after your patents are expired, can this product be genericized? Can other copy, uh, companies make copies of it? And that is called the AND, ANDA process, abbreviated new drug application process. Reason abbreviated because you don't have to do human studies and you do very minimal, uh, I'm sorry, you don't have to do animal studies and very limited human studies. Uh, you, in essence, do uh, for a human uh, a bioequivalence study, bioavailability to determine bioequivalence, which is similar to a phase one clinical trial. Uh, so generics are copies of existing innovative products. Pre-1938 drugs are called grandfathered products. Why 1938? That's when the original Food and Drug Act uh, came out. Now, I don't believe there's any pre-1938 products out there any longer. Um, but if FDA had left you on the market after a, um enactment of the Food and Drug Act in 1938, uh, you would have been called a grandfathered product today. So now let's look at um, what's done with this candidate molecule that we've just developed during this drug development system um, that I talked to you about. <clears throat> First the th thing we consider here Excuse me, just a second. 
is um, non-clinical testing. The term non-clinical means non-human testing, in vitro testing, animal testing. That would fall under that category. So your purpose here is to establish a safety profile in animals. Remember, this is the first biologic system that your molecule will see. I'm making an assumption here, folks. The assumption I'm making is this molecule has never seen a human before. So the first time it sees a biologic system is in these animal models, which you're testing it in. Hopefully, when we do this testing, we can predict potential toxicity in humans, provide rationale for uh, clinical studies in humans. Now, what type of non-clinical tests do we do? We do pharmacology studies. We do tox studies. When we talk about pharmacology, that's the positive aspects of this candidate molecule. Um, you look at the action of the drugs. There's two categories. There's pharmacodynamic studies and pharmacokinetic studies. Pharmacodynamics is the drug's effect on the body. person took the white tablet, reduces his blood pressure. That is a pharmacodynamic effect. Pharmacokinetics is the opposite, is the body's effect on the drug. Um, and therefore, when we talk about pharmacokinetic studies, we talk about ADME studies, A-D-M-E, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, okay? So when we do pharmacology, that's the positive aspects of your product, we're going to be doing these type of studies, pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic studies. On the other hand, when we look at tox, toxicology, that's the branch of uh, science that studies the harmful effects of this product on the human organism, uh, eventually on the human organism, first on the animal, then on the human organism. These are considered on their FDA's uh, categories as safety studies. All um, toxicology studies have to be run under GLP, good laboratory practices. Uh, not true with pharmacology. You don't have to run those under GLP. Um, nothing prevents you from doing that, though. FDA would be most happy if you did that. Uh, but you're not required to legally. So when we look at toxicology, we look at these various kinds of studies that are listed here. Acute study is a single-dose, 24-hour study in rodents. Um, the subchronic study is a multi-dose study up to three months in rodents plus higher-level animals, maybe cats, dogs, rabbits, whatever. Chronic studies are multi-dose over a year period. Repro studies, which is a three-phase study, uh, are studies um, that one does, uh, on again, on rodents um, to see uh, what effect uh, this product might have on a female. Or uh, today we're also required to do male testing. Uh, genetic tox studies are those studies which we um, look at to see what is this product's effect at the cellular level? Does it affect the genes, the chromosomes, whatever? And we look uh, uh, for uh, those kind of mutagenic uh, effects that the product might have. And carcinogenicity studies, if we have to do them, this is optional, you don't always have to do them, we're looking at a two-year study multi-dose. Um, so those are the kind of studies, the safety studies that FDA will have. Now, for the original IND, when you file the original document saying you want to start your human studies, the phase one studies, the only studies you'll have to have is acute studies, subchronic studies, genotox. Once you're doing human studies, side by side with the human studies, you can now be looking at the chronic studies, the longer term studies, maybe carcinogenicity studies, and of course, eventually maybe repro studies. So the question arises now, based on this little bit that I've told you, why regulate non-clinical studies, these non-human studies, albeit in vitro, albeit in an animal? In most cases, they're really orienting towards animals here. How are the non-clinical studies regulated? And what are the key elements uh, of the regulation that covers this? And what non-clinical studies are regulated? So let's look at some of the answers to these questions. Why regulate non-clinical studies? Because this is the only biologic data FDA will have to make a judgment uh, whether you should now go into humans. Is it worth the risk to move into a human model? Everything we do relative to FDA is always benefit risk analysis. That's always the final question. You also do that when you're doing your research. You put this new bit of information into the database, 
And now the last question you ask before you do anything else is, your question is, do the benefits still exceed the risks? If the benefits still exceed the risks, you move forward to the next step in the process. On the other hand, the day the risks exceed the benefits, you stop the project. Well, FDA does the same thing when they get information from you, data from you. Now, uh, the final question they always ask is, do the benefits exceed the risks? Now, based on the data you sent in in the IND, they're now going to make a judgment whether you should go forward into the human uh, model. So the purpose of this regulation that's going to govern these non-clinical studies are to establish a minimum set of universal standards, to ensure the quality of the studies performed, to ensure the integrity of the data produced, to ensure proper conduct and controls exist, and to establish standardized, uh, a standardized report format. Um, so let's look at this regulation. This is the good laboratory practice regulation. That, in the, the drug development process, is the first major regulation you will run into, uh, the good laboratory practice regulation. Notice 21 CFR, Title 21, FDA section, Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, Part 58, which is the first volume. Okay, And uh, there we will have the good laboratory practice regulation. So let's look at this regulation. What are the requirements outlined by the GLP regulation? The four elements for the GLP, the organization, and they're talking about the study director and the separate quality assurance unit uh, that audits these studies as they're being done. What differentiates, folks, a GLP study from a non-GLP study is this QA group. Non-GLP studies don't have this audit group. GL a GLP study does. So element number one is organization. Element number two is qualification. Are the people conducting this process qualified? Is the facility qualified to do these studies? Number three is uh, controls. The test system control. The test system is, in this case, the animal. For example, I have a picture of a rabbit here. That is our test system. The test article is your active product. And, of course, uh, not only do we have controls over those, we have equipment controls, we have facility controls. And, of course, the last thing is ne the necessary documentation uh, for conducting all of this. Uh, all the SOPs, um, what type of procedures we have for handling the animals, the records and reports that we generate, um, the protocol requirements for putting together this GLP study, and finally, the final report. Now, what studies are regulated uh, by these GLPs? All studies intended to determine product safety, tox studies, genotox studies, these are required to be by FDA GLP studies. GLP is not required for basic research, determination of pro uh, potential product utility, uh, determination of physical and chemical characteristics. The last one can be called quality control if you so choose. So uh, we know now in this um, drug development process, uh, we developed this candidate molecule. Uh, what we've done at that point now is put it to, through some in vitro testing. Uh, we put then this candidate molecule through some non-clinical animal testing. And what we are trying to determine in our own minds is, is this product worth the risk to move ahead into a human? Because if you feel it's worth the risk, then you will go through um, the IND process. So let's look at these possible meetings we might have uh, with FDA. During this IND process, again, IND, Investigational New Drug, FDA focuses, the, the focus is FDA attention on the safety aspects. The most important data that you put in the original IND, the first document you send in to FDA, uh, is the toxicology data. That's what FDA uh, relies on the most, assuming this product's never been uh, studied anyplace else in the world. Provide the sponsor greater freedom. Now, uh, before I continue, let me def make some definitions. When you file an IND, FDA refers to you as a sponsor. You are sponsoring non-clinical studies. You're going to be sponsoring clinical studies. When you file an NDA or a BLA, the marketing application, you're called an applicant. You're applying for marketing approval. Okay. So we have that. Provide the sponsor greater freedom in design of early phase clinical development. 
facilitate consultation between the FDA and the drug sponsors, encourage innovative drug development, and enhance uh, prompt marketing uh, approval for safe and effective therapy. So these are the goals here um, during this uh, IND uh, process. Type, uh, there are three goal-setting meetings that FDA has, the first one being the pre-IND. Um, you've already done some non-clinical testing in vitro, maybe even animal, and at this pre-IND meeting, you will discuss that with FDA. You will discuss a further testing that you're going to do in the future. CMC stands for chemistry manufacturing controls how you make and test the active, how you make and test the final product, the characterization of the active. Okay, so you'll discuss that with FDA. Um, you'll discuss the phase one uh, protocol. The last one, fast track review, uh, in my scenario is not possible because this product's never been studied in a human before. Fast track review comes about uh, after you get initial clinical data. If you have a product, that treats a serious and life-threatening disease or condition and has an unmet medical need. What is an unmet medical need? No other therapy exists, or what you have is far superior to what does exist. You may, uh, if FDA agrees, be classified as fast track. What does that do for you? It tells FDA they can reduce the number of studies you have to conduct, and they want to get you on the marketplace faster. The review time will be six months for the NDA. Normally, the standard review time for FDA for a drug product is 10 months. So you save four months on the review, and you reduce the number of studies you have to do. So that's only if we already have fast-track data, if it's approved in another product. If not, we're going to have to generate, generate this clinical under, uh, data under the IND and then make that determination. <clears throat> Second major goal-setting meeting the end of phase two. Phase one and phase two are considered the major research phases. At the end of that phase two, uh, FDA wants to see if you're now qualified to move into the phase three pivotal trials, pivotal. Why is it called pivotal? Because the approval pivots on this. The phase three data is the only data FDA will look at for approval. Why? Phase one and phase two, uh, you don't have the marketing product defined yet. I mean, you're looking at different indications, different doses, different... Um, uh, schedules, different manufacturing methods, different formulations. By the end of phase two, you should have defined what they call the fabulous five. You should have defined the indication, the dose, the schedule, the manufacturing method, the formulation. Once you have that defined, and FDA agrees that the data looks good, you, they will then let you into the phase three pivotal trials um, because now you have a product that's representative of what's going to the marketplace. So that's the goal of a uh, end of phase two meeting is if FDA will allow you to go to phase three. And of course, the last major goal setting meeting is the pre-NDA meeting. You've done all your clinical trials. Um, certainly at that meeting, you determine which studies FDA will uh, define as adequate and well controlled. Uh, any unresolved issues you'll discuss with FDA. And of course, statistical approach will be discussed. At, the, at this meeting, the pre-NDA meeting, you're required to bring your statistician, and FDA will have their statistician there. The goal here is whether uh, is for FDA to say to you, yes, you can file your NDA. Certainly, uh, it's important. FDA meet meetings are important. Um, so, if you wanted to now set up a, a meeting with FDA, uh, one of the things uh, we do here is, uh, for example, if you contact my company, a lot of what we do is. Uh, get people ready for FDA meetings. Uh, I would contact the division you're going to be working with, the project manager, uh, and then um, what we will do is they will inform us about the information package they want, and we'll send this in. Um, this information package is general background on your molecule and will enable FDA to determine if they want to have a meeting with you or if a meeting's not necessary. A few weeks later, hopefully, FDA will call and say they've granted the meeting. I will send a confirming letter with the date, the agenda, and attendees from our company. And certainly, if there's any going to be any presentation, a copy of that. And we'll send uh, these copies uh, to FDA. Um, this is the general scheme that I follow that I've developed since 1985 um, about who can go to FDA meetings. 
Uh, uh, first of all, I'm very careful on the people we allow to go to FDA meetings. Not everyone's qualified. Everyone may well be qualified to work in your company. In fact, you, you probably have people that you consider genius that are working in your company. But ask them to explain something, it's a problem for them. Um, those kind of people don't do you any good at FDA meetings. So we choose the people based on three criteria. One, they know the area of expertise very well. Two, um, they can uh, present it well, uh, present it understandably in a very efficient manner. And number three, they have to handle stress well. Unless you've been to an FDA meeting, you don't understand what I'm saying here. When you go to an FDA meeting, there's no pressure on FDA at all. Whether your product gets approved or not, they really don't care. But the pressure on you might be different. Pressure on you might be your company may not survive if this product doesn't get approved. So uh, it's a very a different type. And, and the last place you want to see, find out a person can't handle that kind of stress is in an FDA meeting. Um, so we picked those people. Uh, FDA today allows max an hour and a half for a meeting. Um, and what I'll do is I'll put you through rehearsals. First, with the, uh, I'll have you write up presentations. We'll all agree on the presentations. We'll agree that the wording's correct. Um, and then we'll practice the group by itself, and we'll practice enough time till you're very familiar with it. Then I'll put you in front of a group that knows the product, knows the technology, um, ask them how well it was received. Any questions they have, we take down, we prepare answers to, because if they can ask the questions, if they can ask the same questions. And finally, we put you in front of a group uh, that doesn't know the product or technology. And again, go through the same process. How well did they receive it? How understandable is it? Uh, and of course, uh, any questions they have, we take down. I'm extremely conservative. Uh, I go to FDA the day before. I don't take any chances. Planes don't fly, bad weather, uh, traffic jams, or any of that. It's difficult to get an FDA meeting, so I want to make sure I make it. Final rehearsal is the night before. We'll go through that. By now, you're very familiar with it. You'll blow through the presentation. Uh, we'll discuss answers to all the questions that came up. And then we'll discuss our positions that we're going to discuss with FDA. We'll go to the FDA meeting. We'll dress accordingly. Um, what I mean by that is, listen, I work with FDA. Um, I consult for them. I know what they really think of the industry. Um, and they're very much um, think that we're uh, arrogant uh, we think we know it all. Uh, we like to show off. Um, you know, you come in with the thousand dollar. The guy comes in with the thousand dollar suit. It's going to annoy FDA. A woman comes in with all the jewelry. It's going to annoy FDA. So I, I prepare you for those things. I make sure we don't do the things that would disturb FDA. Um, certainly, when you with me in an FDA meeting, if you're not speaking, you're taking notes. Everyone takes notes, and there's a reason for that. Um, and certainly, uh, I try to train you that you answer questions directly. Remember, folks, you, the max you have is an hour and a half here. Um, you know, many scientists, um, unfortunately, when they answer a question, have 14 contingencies with it. Well, unfortunately, in an FDA meeting, we don't have time to discuss all these contingencies. So I try to make sure you answer questions directly. If you don't know, I, I, I have no problem with you saying to FDA, I don't know, I'll get the information for you. I will coordinate the meeting with you at the end of the meeting. We'll thank FDA. And, of course, at the end of that meeting, we already have discussed a place where we'll meet and we'll review the notes together to make sure we all agreed on what was said at the meeting. And then someone will prepare uh, meeting notes uh, to send to meeting minutes to send to FDA. So that's the way that system works, um, getting you ready for the FDA meeting. So let's look at the IND now. Okay. The Food and Drug Act, which is the major FDA law, the, empowers the FDA with the authority to promulgate regulations regarding the drug approval process, and they have the IND and the NDA regulations. Require sponsors, those are the people that have filed the IND, to establish the safety and efficacy of a drug prior to marketing, to establish labeling requirements for new drugs, to require manufacturers to conform to GMP, good manufacturing practice regulations, and, of course, um, the law establishes, um, well, FDA really established, um, to be vis a vis vis regulations, the IND requirements and the NDA requirements. How are the regulations in, uh, enforced here? Section 505 of the, new, of the Food and Drug Act is the new drug section. 
prohibits any person, person meaning company also, from introducing or delivering into interstate transport and unless a, an approved application establishing safety and effectiveness is in effect. Now, you might say, wait a minute, I just developed this molecule. Uh, it's certainly not approved. And that's true, it's not. So that's the problem with this sentence. This sentence comes right out of the law. What saves us? The IND saves us. One of the uh, requirements of the IND, uh, or one of the characteristics of the IND, is it allows you to take a non-approved product and study it um, inter inter in in put it in interstate commerce in the U.S. and enable you to do in vitro and human studies. So what is the purpose of the IND? To provide technical information on the investigational new drug to allow assessment of risk. What information? Well, you're going to put into that all the non-clinical work you've done, the in vitro work, the animal studies. Number two, you're going to provide FDA with a protocol for the first clinical studies you're going to run. And number three, you have the CMC section, Chemistry and Manufacturing Controls, where you're telling FDA how I make and test the active, characterization of the active, how I make and test the final product. So number that's how they make a risk assessment. To provide an exemption from the Food and Drug Act banning the interstate shipment of unapproved products, once the IND is effective, we can now take the unapproved products, put it into interstate commerce, and we can do these studies with them. And ask, formally ask FDA permission to do human clinical trials. Uh, if it is deemed to be an effective IND, then we can do human clinical trials. Now, these are the three main sections of the IND. The non-clinical section, which is the pharmacology and toxicology data. Um, the clinical section which is initially just the proposed protocol for the phase one trials, and the CMC section uh, to assure the identity, quality, strength, purity, stability, and reproducibility of our particular product. That we can make this candidate molecule time after time after time to meet the same specifications. Um, so um, those are the three main sections upon which FDA will make a determination whether it's worth the risk to go ahead into human clinical trials. Here is all the sections of the IND. There's 10 sections. You will have a cover letter introducing this. You will call this in the cover letter original IND, original IND. Okay. After that, anytime you send in additional information, because you never send the whole IND in again, you just send in certain sections of it depending on the data that you have. For example, you have um, new non-clinical data. You'll then prepare an amendment. What is the definition of an amendment? An amendment is a change to a non-approved application, a change to a non-approved application. INDs are never approved, therefore they're always amended. On the other hand, NDA is a little different. NDA, before it's approved, you send in amendments when you make changes. On the other hand, once an NDA is approved, and you send in changes, it's called a supplement to the IND. You're supplementing the approval. So let's look through this uh, IND category. There is an IND form called the 1571 form you're required to fill out and then sign. It, in essence, tells you all these sections on the back of the form. It's a one-page, two-sided form. Um, and it, in essence, is a contract. If you read it, it says you're bound to follow all FDA rules and regulations under this IND process. You will then have a table of contents, which will describe where in this IND these other sections are. Um, section 3 is an introductory statement. You'll introduce the molecule to FDA. Um, you'll basically um, give the various names of the molecule, the chem chemical composition, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, number four is a guesstimate, a general investigational plan. Um, it's a idea that you have uh, what you are going to do relative to studies for the first 12 months. FDA recognizes Section 4 is a guesstimate. They're not going to hold you to it because they know based on the data you get, this plan might change. But they want to get an idea of how you're going to study this product. Section 5 is the first major section, investigational brochure. For those of you not familiar, 
It's a document that in summary form has all the studies that you've done uh, on this particular product. It is one of the documents we give out during human clinical studies to the various investigators. Section six is the clinical protocol, and that is your protocol for your phase one study. Uh, you, in addition to that, have a form there called a 1572 form or investigator form. It will tell the principal investigator who's ru running this study for you what location they're at, um, who the sub-investigators are, if there are any sub-investigators. Um, so it'll give that kind of information. And the principal investigator must sign it, and you'll send it in under this IND. It will bind the principal investigator to FDA rules and regulations. Section 7 right now is going to be one of the larger sections. 7 and, seven and 8 are the two largest initially. Chemistry manufacturing control section. How you make and test the active, the characterization of the active. By the way, what is characterization uh, of a product? It's a physical, chemical, and if necessary, a biological definition of the product. For example, you know, physical, you might say it's a white, free-flowing powder. Chemically, uh, you might give it structure. Uh, you might give the melting point, the isoelectric point, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, that's where you develop your specifications from. Um, also, how you make and test the final product. Pharmacology and toxicology studies you've done. Remember the pharmacology are the pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic studies you run. Uh, and, of course, toxicology are those safety studies I showed you. Section 9, you have to include, even if you have n no previous human experience. FDA wants all these sections accounted for. If you do have previous human experience, for example, the product was approved in another country, you'll put a summation of the safety. That's what FDA is concerned with. Um, if it's not uh, been approved any place, you'll just say this section not applicable, but you include the section. And then, of course, Section 10, if it doesn't fit in Section 1 to 9, you put it in Section 10, such as a bibliography. Hey, uh, the IND process is, is, is a dynamic process. Although we can only talk about it um, in a parallel fashion, um, not in a parallel fashion, in a continuous fashion, um, it does run in parallel. For example, uh, non-clinical studies continue in parallel with clinical development. Manufacturers... Uh, manufacturing, uh, we start at the, labs, the, the lab scale, to the pilot scale, to the commercial scale. Uh, certainly we, we uh, send amendments into the IND of all these changes that we're making along the way. And certainly as you get further, phase one, phase two, phase three, the IND requirements increase. So uh, let's look at this whole IND review process. So you put this IND together with all those ten sections that I just described. And, um, and then we send it down to, in this case, let's assume it's a dr chemical synthetic drug, the Center for Drugs, okay? Um, and what is their what is their functions to develop FDA p policy with regard to the safety, effectiveness, and labeling of all drug products to review and evaluate NDAs and INDs, which is what we're talking about now, to develop and implement standards for the safety and effectiveness of over-the-counter drugs, those drugs that are approved uh, with this um, monograph system that we talked about before, to monitor the quality of marketing drug products through product testing, surveillance, and compliance, uh, coordinate with CBA the Biologic Center on the review of biologic products, to develop and promulgate guidelines for GMP, the manufacturing regulations, to develop and disseminate uh, information and educational materials concerning drug products to the medical community, basically the doctors out there and the pharmacists, to conduct research and develop scientific standards on um, these particular drugs, to collect and evaluate information on the effects and trends of the use of marketed drugs. FDA has the largest, uh, the world's largest uh, adverse event database to monitor prescription drug advertising and promotional uh, materials to assess how accurate they are, to analyze data on poisoning, and to cooperate with other FDA offices. So these are the things that the Center for Drugs does. Principal goal of the IND, um, to determine if the non-clinical test data uh, that you've uh, sent in and other data provide adequate evidence the drug is reasonably safe for administration to humans. Remember, all drugs have risks. 
But FDA is trying to do here is benefit risk based on the data you sent in. Now, you sent an IND in, which tells FDA automatically that you feel the benefits exceed the risk. Now, FDA has the final say to see if they agree with you. Determine if the protocol for the proposed clinical studies will expose clinical subjects to unnecessary uh, risks. And this is, we are assuming this is our phase one protocol. And to determine that the sponsor's manufacturing and process procedures will be adequate to ensure the compound is adequately reproducible and stable in its pure form. In other words, uh, every time you make it, that you'll meet uh, the same specifications that you've developed. This is what a review division looks like as a division director or deputy director in these four major groups. Medical officers, pharmacology, toxicologists, chemists, and the project manager. Okay? So you have to remember this because this is going to come up in another second now. So we send our IND in. If it's a hard copy, and the FDA wants everything electronic today, um, in certain cases they allow hard copy. It has to be three copies if it's hard copy. IND sent in and it goes through the central document room. There uh, on the, uh, the document people put your information up on the computer. Um, company name, IND name, date, and they assign an IND number. Then based on indication, they send it to the right review division. For example, cardiovascular drug, they'll send it to cardiovascular division. Oncology drug goes over the oncology group, and so on and so forth. Once it gets to the review division, they bring it to their document room. They prepare a history card. History cards are nothing more than a table of contents that are list. The original IND came in on this date, and then they'll list every amendment and what the amendment was about. And they will now assign you a project manager for this IND, and that project manager, who's going to be your main contact, uh, will send a letter to you saying, we receive your IND on this date, here's your IND number, here's who I am, I'm your main contact. And then the project manager will call for a review committee to be put together. INDs are reviewed by committee, not by single person. So in this, on this committee will be a medical officer, who many times is the chairman, the ca uh, chemist, pharmacologist, toxicologist individual, uh, a statistician, a project manager, and then anyone else they need um, based on the requirements of the uh, IND. For example, some review committees have microbiologists, others don't because they don't need them. Some have engineers, others don't because they don't need them, so on and so forth. This committee will be um, developed or designed to meet the requirements of the IND document. The reviews are basically done individually. No one person looks at the whole IND. Um, it will be now uh, broken up into sections. The medical officer will get the clinical section. Statistician will also get the clinical section. Um, the chemist will get the CMC section. Uh, pharmacologist, toxicologist, whoever it is, gets the non-clinical section, and so on and so forth. The, the project manager um, gets pertinent, you know, those other sections uh, for review. So um, this is how it's done. Ninety percent of all review is done on their own time. Um, they have weekly meetings. And at the weekly meeting, the only thing that's discussed is problems they found in their section. For example, medical officer will, if there's any problems in their section, we'll talk about it. Same with the CMC section, same with the clinical section. Um, and this will go on for these uh, four weeks because there's 30 calendar days to review uh, this IND. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, they will then make a determination relative to your IND. So this is the way it works. Each reviewer prepares what they call a review package, which they'll give to the chairman, who then prepares a decision package. What's the decision? The IND is effective or it's on clinical hold. Those are the only two decisions. Either it's on effective or on clinical hold, and then the division director signs off on it. Each reviewer completes an evaluation package. The committee chair prepares a decision package requires division director's approval, although it's a pro forma approval. And now either the IND is going to be effective, whereby you can do clinical trials, or you're on hold, meaning there's issues you have to resolve before you can do clinical trials. Okay? So that's where we are at this point. 
INDs never get approved. They become effective. If you're on clinical hold, there's issues you have to resolve with FDA. Now, once the IND is effective, you're doing your studies, how do you update this document? Because you're going to be doing different studies as, as time goes on. Well, there's protocol amendments, there's information amendments, there's annual reports, and there's safety reports. So let's look at those things. There's uh, three different kinds of protocol amendments, modification of an existing protocol, um, so now what you're going to take is the existing protocol. Um, you're going to now put the new protocol in. You're going to explain to FDA why the modification, um, and you're going to send it in as an amendment. Now, when you send it in, you send the 1571 form along with it. On the back, it has all 10 sections listed. You'll just mark off the section that is pertinent here, which is Section 6, uh, and you'll send it in to FDA. Now, also, you have the serial number all amendments. So you will have the IND number, dash, and on the front there will be a spot. You'll put 0001 for the First Amendment, 0002 for the Second, and so on. Um, so the first type of amendment is the protocol amendment. The second one is addition of a new protocol. You, first, you finish the first study, you want to do a new clinical study, you'll do the same thing. You'll fill out the 1571 form. It'll explain it's a new protocol. You'll serial number and send it in. The third type of update under protocol amendments is adding new sites, new investigator, new IRB information, where the site's located. That uh, information goes on along with that 1572 form, that investigator form I talked about before. All other amendments are called information amendments, new chemistry data, changes to manufacturing new pharmacology data, new toxicology data. So there's protocol amendments, which are three different types, new protocols, modifications to existing protocols, new sites, and the, there's new chemistry data, um, such as for characterization or significant manufacturing changes, pharmacology and toxicology, and they're called all information amendments. Every amendment you send in, you have to send in with the 1572, it has to be serial numbered. On the back, you tell what section applies to Once a year, within 60 days of the IND going into effect, you have to send in an annual report. And what the annual report does is update FDA on the status of all investigations, new safety information, non-clinical changes, manufacturing changes. Now, FDA has seen all this information already. What they just want to do is they want to have a capsule of what you did during the previous 12 months. Now, there is no uh, format for a, an annual report. Here's one that I use that FDA finds acceptable. The first one is summary. It's a table. Uh, all it says is we've sent in all these amendments during the previous 12 months. Um, we give the date. We give the amendment number, the, of course, the IND number, and a little write-up on what the amendment was about. Uh, we certainly don't send the data in again because they have that already. makes it easy for FDA to locate stuff if they want to. Number two is the summary study, clinical study summary. If there were completed studies during the previous 12 months, we'll give a summary of that. If there are studies that are still ongoing, give a summary of that. Three is the safety information. Uh, for each completed study, we'll put all the safety information. If there's ongoing studies, we'll put all the safety information there. Adverse events, uh, if people dropped out, if people died, and so on. Number four, remember that investigational plan. That was the guesstimate you're going to do the first 12 months. FDA wants you to update that. They also want an updated investigative brochure because you have to update the investigative brochure, remember? That's the document you use during clinical to give the investigator. In summary, it has all the studies you've done. So as you're ongoing, you're doing more studies, you have to update this. If you made clinical protocol modifications during the previous 12 months, FDA wants to know what they were and why. That's if you've done it. If not, the section not applicable. Seven and eight are optional. Uh, if you have foreign marketing, FDA wants safety updates. And if there's anything else they want, that would be under number eight. Again, again, this is not a required format. This is one that I use, so um, certainly feel free if you want to modify it. FDA finds it acceptable. What are safety reports? Those are those ad adverse uh, experiences during a clinical that are classified as serious and unexpected and associated with the use of the drug. Now, what is serious? Serious is fatal, life-threatening, 
causes an anomaly, causes a disability, um, causes hospitalization, prolongs hospitalization, and the famous other. Let me run through that again. Fatal, life-threatening, causes an anomaly, causes a disability, uh, causes hospitalization, prolongs hospitalization, and the famous other. Anything else FDA wants to categorize. Unexpected, not associated with the labeling, which is the investigative brochure in this case, and associated with the use of the drug. Now, that's the last one is the most difficult. Uh, if you've been through this process before, uh, and I've been through it many times, Trying to associate an adverse event with a, with a particular product at times is difficult because you don't have much of a database at this point. For example, a person comes into the clinic, uh, into the investigational site, gets this drug treatment, leaves, walks down the street, crosses the street, hit by a car, killed. Is that drug related or not? Uh, I mean, those are the kind of decisions that you have to make. Um, so um, it is difficult at times. I always err uh, on the side of safety in the sense that if I'm not sure, I'll file with FDA anyway. What's the requirements here? Well, if it's fatal or life-threatening, only if it's fatal or life-threatening, seven calendar day notification, phone fax, followed by a 15 calendar day full report. If it's other than fatal or life-threatening, such as an anomaly, a disability, hospitalization, just the 15-calendar-day report. There's different states that the IND is in, an active state where you're, where you're doing studies under it and you're sending in information to FDA. In an active status, uh, you haven't done any, any studies within two years, FDA will send you a, a letter saying, uh, either you start studies or you withdraw the IND. Withdrawn status is a company um, initiated uh, action uh, where you withdraw the IND saying we're no longer going to be doing any work under this IND. IND termination is an FDA action. When you see the term termination, it's FDA. They feel the product's a problem, a hazard, or you haven't met all the necessary regulations, so they're going to terminate your IND. So now let's, uh, we've talked about the IND. <clears throat> we talked about all the 10 sections of the IND. We talk about the type of work, the studies that you put into the IND. Uh, we also mentioned that you're going to have a protocol for this first study that you're going to do. So let's talk about these clinical trials. Of course, that's the major data which FDA will rely on eventually for approval of this product. Um, I've taken an FDA table and I've, I've um, modified it. Um, their table was old and outdated. And, and these are all the phases. Phase zero, which is optional. Phase zero, which is optional. Phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Um, so those are the various phases. Uh, just a second, folks. Let me check something. All right. Um, those are the various phases. Phase zero, I say, is optional. For example, when would you use phase zero? Let's assume that uh, as you're developing these candidate molecules, there's two molecules that you can't, with all the in vitro animal testing, differentiate from. What phase zero allows you to do is go into a human at sub-pharmacologic doses, sub-pharmacologic doses, and uh, actually do something similar to a phase one trial where one uh, is now looking at pharmacokinetics in the human to try to help you make a determination which molecule you should move ahead on. Phase one studies are uh, the typical um, pharmacokinetic studies I just mentioned. For example, the first study you run in phase one is a single rising dose study. You have these small cohorts of patients popular cohort today is eight patients, um, six active, two placebo. We run this blinded now compared to what we did in the past where we ran open studies. We run it blinded to try to minimize bias. And what the first study will run is single rising dose. We'll do increasing dose um, until we find an unacceptable response. So that gives us dose range. Um, that also gives us um, PK data, pharmacokinetics, Genetic data, because we're taking blood samples during this. We'll do all the physical testing, all the biochemical testing. Uh, so all that data for each cohort, and we'll try to establish the safety of the product. Phase two is the major research phase. 
Here, by the end of phase two, you will have to determine um, the indication, the dose, the schedule, the formulation, the manufacturing method. Okay? So you will do all the necessary studies in phase two. For example, usually the first study we do in phase one is a, uh, is a uh, three-arm study. Why? Most molecules are multi-indicational today. So one of the things you want to do is find out which indication you want to move forward with. You don't go with the, both indications. Why? Cost you more money, cost you more time, and if FDA holds up one indication, it may hold up both. So we try to pick out what indication we can get from A to Z with the fastest. So once we get to market and approve, we're getting return on investment. Now we can go back and supplement the NDA for the second indication. Phase three is the pivotal trials. Those are the trials which FDA will look at. Uh, for safety and effectiveness for approval. Notice they're called confirmatory. They are confirming the end result of all the research we've done. And phase four is a post-marketing study. The FDA may require, and they do require it under fast track because they put you on the market with reduced amounts of studies, um, that while you're marketing, you also run a study side by side. <coughs> there are two endpoints we look at uh, during clinical trial safety and efficacy. Efficacy clinical endpoints, these are the events or measurements used to assess a drug's effectiveness. There's primary endpoints, which is most of the time what you'll be using. On occasion, we'll be using surrogate endpoints. A primary endpoint, primary endpoint, directs observation, effect of the drug on the progression of the disease or condition. Direct observation. Surrogate endpoint is an indirect observation, effect of the drug on the progression of the disease or condition. So um, we have these um, efficacy parameters we're, we're looking at, which are determined by these endpoints, and, of course, the safety parameters, which are determined by the adverse events that happen. So now let's talk about um, the various studies, the Phase one trials. Um, I mentioned already the dose escalation, the single rising dose. We'll also wind up doing a multiple rising dose because it's rare that you only use a product once. Uh, and, of course, these phase one studies have to do with pharmacokinetics. Um, and so these are the type of studies that you look at in phase one. Phase two, the major research phase, uh, we have to make all these determinations. Um, and so we're going to be running a, a number of different studies uh, in phase two. Uh, certainly the uh, first we'll try to determine indication, then we'll determine dose, uh, and certainly uh, you know, all these things uh, have to be done here uh, during this uh, phase um, to study. Um, the reason I say indication and dose, because those are the studies we typically run in phase two. First of all, to determine which indication we want to move ahead with and what dose is the, the best dose. So we look at minimal effective dose, that is, lowest dose for the best profile. FDA has told us, and we fully realize clinically, the lower the dose to get the same profile, we're better off or the patient's better off. Uh, other studies now are optional. You may have to do studies to determine schedule. Use it once a day, twice a day. You may not. You may have various formulations. You might have to do a study comparing one to the other. Various manufacturing methods, the same thing. So as you can see, phase two, you're going to do a lot of work. If you have a highly absorbed product uh, with uh, that's uh, oral, uh, you have to do a food effect study. It's a three-arm study. Um, you uh, break the populations in three arms. The first arm gets the drug before a high-fat meal. The second arm gets it during a high-fat meal. The third arm gets it after a high-fat meal. Um, and so, therefore, um, you'll try to determine if that affects the absorption at all. Phase three studies are those studies we try to FDA uses for approval of the product. If there are approved products out there already, FDA will have you go against the approved product. If there is no approved product out there, you either go against placebo or standard of care. These pivotal clinical trials that I just talked about, uh, and certainly um, the Food and Drug Act says for drugs, you require substantial evidence of safety and effectiveness for approval. The term substantial evidence means evidence consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations. And that's, you know, these adequate and well-controlled investigations are what FDA bases the approval on. And, of course, uh, 
what the law says, substantial evidence derived from more than one adequate and well-controlled trial. So what's an adequate and well-controlled trial? One that meets these seven characteristics. Uh, and that is um, it has a, an objective, which is, of course, the safety and effectiveness relative to the claim. There's a randomized selection of groups, so you have a randomized trial. Adequate measures to minimize bias, so you have a blinded trial. And a design that permits a valid comparison with a control. So you have a control trial. So you have a randomized, blinded, controlled trial. You have a method of selecting the subject population, and that's in the inclusion exclusion criteria in the protocol. And you have well defined and reliable methods of assessment. And that's with the endpoints and safety. And finally, you have an adequate analysis of the study results to assess the effects of the drug. Well, you have to use the right statistical methods, and you have to have adequate numbers of patients to get a valid statistical result. If you have these seven characteristics, then you have what FDA calls an adequate and well-controlled trial. So here's FDA's logic. Substantial evidence of more than one adequate and well-controlled trial is what um, the law says. You meet the seven criteria of adequate and well-controlled investigation. You conduct two or more such studies. Um, you generate clinical data. If you follow GCPs, the statistics are correct. You have adequate numbers of subjects. You have something called substantial evidence. Thus, you have met FDA's requirement, deriving substantial evidence from more than one adequate and well-controlled trial. Now, today, 80% of all NDAs are proof of one adequate and well-controlled trial. When the law was written, the statistical methods weren't very powerful. Today, they are extremely powerful. So FDA will approve with just one adequate and well-controlled trial. What is a control? A standard of comparison for varying the results of an experiment and a means for isolating the true drug effect from background noise. Uh, okay, so what you want to see is the true drug effect relative to safety and effectiveness. When we do clinicals, we have to follow G, uh, GCPs, good clinical practice. That's the second major regulation. You have the sponsor requirements, the investigator requirements, the RB requirements. The sponsor is responsible for picking the investigations, investigators, I'm sorry, monitoring um, the trials, informing the investigations, uh, investigators of all the necessary information. Um, they review the ongoing data. They keep all the necessary rec uh, records and they ensure the accountability of the product. So the investigator here controls the drug, keeps all the necessary records, writes all the necessary reports, assures the IRB is over reviewing uh, and overseeing the study, and if there's, <coughs> excuse me, if there's controlled uh, substances that they're stored correctly. <coughs> excuse me. Um, Prior to approval, there will be two inspections by FDA, a GMP inspection for manufacturing, <coughs> and the FDA Bio Research Monitoring Group will do a clinical inspection. They'll pick certain sites and inspect them. So let's now talk about the NDA since we've done all the necessary IND work. We've done all the clinicals, the non-clinicals. What is the NDA process here? Facilitate the approval of safe, effective drugs to improve FDA surveillance of marketing drugs and to force the communication between FDA and the sponsor. Purpose of the NDA, to provide documented evidence of the safety of the drug, provide documented evidence uh, of the eff effect efficacy of the drug, and to provide an approvable mechanism. Now, the NDA, different than the IND, the IND had 10 sections. The NDA now has 20 sections. The index, which is a fancy way of saying table of contents, labeling, overall summary, I'll explain that in a second, chemistry section, the non-clinical studies, human pharmacokinetics is the phase one studies, clinical microbiology, only if you have an anti-infective, clinical data section, which is the phase two and three studies, safety update, statistical section, case report form tabulations, those case report forms you have to send in. Only send them in if someone died or um, someone dropped out. Patent information, so FDA can make an assessment whether to genericize the drug. 14 is not applicable. That's only for generics. 15 is only for generics. Debarment certification, field copy certification, user fee. 
Uh, user fee right now is $1.2 million for uh, review of an NDA. Now, if you have no products on the marketplace, you're a new company, you'll get a waiver. But once you get a first product approved, you have to pay the $1.2 million. Financial information and then the famous other section. So those are the 20 sections uh, uh, of the NDA. <clears throat> we can use foreign data today. It's acceptable if it was done according to GCP. And the GCP everyone follows today is ICH GCP, the Q6 document. Um, the population studies applicable to the U.S. population, FDA can review the data. Um, you certainly, like said, such as case report forms, review the qualification investigators. You can use foreign data in your submission in lieu of doing U.S. studies. So what about the review process for the NDA? Two copies are required, archival copy, review copy. FDA will ask for many more. Now, the same review committee that looked at the IND will also look at the NDA. So uh, you have um, now uh, here um, a group that has a history of this whole product. NDA goes in, central document room, NDA name, number, dates put up on a computer, same review division that looked at the IND, same uh, project manager. Uh, they'll prepare a new history card for the NDA. You'll get a letter when they received it. Uh, then it, 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 the project manager will do a re, uh, refuse to file review. What is a refuse to file review? Make sure every section's there, each section's complete. They won't look at any data. They just want to make sure everything's ready for the committee. Uh, certainly, if it's uh, okay, they'll hand it out to the committee. The meetings will start. Now, FDA will either have six or ten months, depending if you're fast track or not, to review this document. If it's not acceptable, you will get a phone call and a letter from FDA saying you've been refused, and they will charge you a 25% fee, a penalty, 25% of $1.2 million. They will take the 25%, they will send the balance back, and then you'll have to redo the NDA and submit with a new $1.2 million. Now remember, before a document's approved, it's called an amendment. So here you can amend the NDA along the, uh, the review uh, that FDA has. If they have questions, you'll be sending in uh, the answers to the questions. And these are called uh, amendments. Um, certainly, uh, if it's a major amendment, they're going to extend the review committee. For example, you have to redo the analysis of a clinical trial. Uh, certainly, FDA is going to extend the review time. Remember I told you there's two inspections. There's also going to be the evaluation packages from every reviewer on the review committee. And you may also go to an advisory committee. These are outside experts, scientists, doctors, non-FDA employees who only have recommending power, but listen to this number. In 98% of the cases, FDA agrees with what they recommend. So you will have coming into the chairman, the medical officer, Evaluation packages from each reviewer, results of the GMP inspection, results of the GCP inspection, recommendation from the advisory committee, um, those are the things that person will be working for. These pre-approval inspections I talked about take place prior to approval, right near the end of the process. Uh, for the GMP one, They'll see what you uh, wrote in the document is the way you make and test the product, and you do it according to GMP. Once FDA has approved your NDA, a company now may market the drug. Now, don't forget, there's also post-approval requirements uh, that you have to keep. As long as the IND is in effect, you have annual reports every year. The same thing is true with the NDA. As long as the product's being sold, you have to do updates every year uh, for the NDA. And that's it, folks. Now is your, the, in the last 20, no, last 20 minutes, last 10 minutes that we have, uh, you have uh, any, you have time now to ask me any questions. If you don't think of the questions now, um, you notice that my email address is on the, um, is on the presentation here. You can just send me emails and I would gladly answer uh, the uh, questions that you have relative to this particular presentation uh, that I'm giving. Michael, any instructions? 
Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, like uh, Albert just said, if you have any questions for him, uh, if you want to directly put forward any verbal questions for him, uh, you can uh, directly click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon on your participant screen. That way, I can unmute your individual lines, and you can directly put forward your questions for Albert. Or you can uh, you send any questions using the chat messenger or the Q&A panel. And also, like Albert said as well, if you do come up with questions at any time after today's session, you have uh, Albert's email address on the screen or on the handouts which you received as well. You can uh, feel free to send any questions directly over to him, or you can send any questions over to us as well. And we'll make sure these questions are forwarded to Albert to get you your answer. So if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, for Albert today on today's topic, please go ahead. Uh, this would be your time. And while we just wait for the question, just want to remind you all as well, if you do come up with uh, also suggestions, you can uh, send them over as well. And I uh, just want to remind you all that today's session is available in a recorded format. So if you feel that any of your colleagues, your friends, or anybody else in your organization could benefit from today's session, you can have them log on to our website. We have a dedicated web page for Albert on our website at globalcompliancepanel.com. So you can go through the topics which are upcoming and the past topics as well. There are uh, some of the well-known topics for Albert which uh, you could uh, see on the website. These are past topics. We have recorded version of these. And you can uh, make a purchase by calling in, or you can make a purchase online on our website as well. And those those uh, might be beneficial for you or anybody else in your organization. And uh, Albert, I don't see any questions coming up. No, I'll just give it an that. extra 30 seconds. Uh, okay, I'll just give so it an extra 30 seconds to see if we do have questions. While we're doing that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me uh, for this webinar. I'd like to thank Michael for hosting it. And again, just remind you, if there are any additional questions later on, just feel free to email. Michael, thank uh, you for Absolutely. Have a, have a no good problem, day. Albert. Albert, I have, uh, I have a question uh, before yeah. we go. I think one of our attendees just came up with a question. So I'll just go ahead and unmute the line here. Uh, hello, Rosa? Yes, hi. Um, I have a question. Um, First, thank you very much. This was one of the best presentations that I have heard, and I've heard many over times. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my question uh, relates to <clears throat> more and more sponsors are doing alternative study designs for their clinical trials, hoping that throughout the phase two, they can, by doing interim analysis, determine the best effective dose, cut down the number of patients, and get the compound to phase three, shortening the time, shortening the expense, and bringing the drug earlier in the market. How is FDA looking on this type of designs? First of all, uh, that type of design has to have FDA approval. So if you're considering doing that, uh, where you're now, uh, let me just say something to the group. Traditionally, with a clinical trial, FDA expects that you will have the traditional protocol, and then you will follow the protocol exactly, and they would prefer no interim analysis. This is FDA's position. Why? Because they feel if you look at time after time after time, you're going to find something you like. This is what they would um, prefer. Now, if you do an interim analysis with a traditional protocol, there is a biostatistical penalty you have to pay, and your statisticians will explain that to you. Well, as Rosa just said, FDA has come up with alternative protocols. But the problem with the alternative protocol is as follows. It can only be used if you have a drug that treats a serious and life-threatening disease or condition, and FDA has to approve that you can do, use this alternative protocol. Now, what the alternative protocol dif is different than the standard or the traditional, it is as Rosa explained. She said, well, now we got interim analysis. This is expected. And based on that interim analysis, we can make changes to this protocol. But again, let me remind you two things. The product has to treat a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. And number two, has to have FDA okay before you can use that protocol. Rosa, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Michael. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, just want to reiterate that if you do come up with questions at any time after today's session, please send them over. We'll make sure these questions are forwarded to our speaker, or you can directly get in touch with him as well. And just before you go, I just want to remind you all that the feedback form is open in the polling area, so kindly go do share your feedback on today's session. Uh, there are just over eight questions, and they're all multiple charts in nature. So it shouldn't take you more than uh, a minute or two to share your feedback before we log off. We would really appreciate your feedback. This is only because it would help us make our webinars better as we go along. So we are looking for feedback to make sure we understand how today's session completed and also to make our webinars better. This, again, applies not just to the Global Compliance Panel theme, but also our speaker, Mr. Albert Gignone, as well. So please kindly share your feedback before you log off. And at the same time, if you have any suggestions on any topic or if you have suggestions on today's webinar as well, you can directly get in touch with us. You have our information on screen, or you can write in or give us a call as well. And uh, Albert has a webinar coming up in the month of March. You have his information on screen, and you can make a purchase if you are interested as well. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for participating in today's webinar. And on behalf of our speaker and the entire Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all for participating and hope you all have a lovely year ahead. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and take care.